Hey, good afternoon, everybody, and um, uh, happy Wednesday. It's another hump day. We are uh, halfway through the week, and uh, everybody hopefully is um, uh, had a little lunch today, and um, we uh, we got our topic around uh, um, A ones and <clears throat> tour management and all the challenges that that go around that. Um, you know whether touring as you define it in in uh, uh, days, months, uh, or you know fly dates, one-offs. You know so many different so many different components that make that up. And I know um, everybody's thinking right now. Well, we're not doing that right now. Well, now's the time to be thinking about it, right? Um, not just thinking about it because we're we're excited to to maybe work uh, at some point, but but also because. How am I? How do I do things? How do I approach um, problems? You know, and we got a little, um, we got a little bandwidth. Um, you know, we're going to talk a lot today about um, uh, our attitudes and 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 people around us. You know, towards the end, we'll we'll kind of circle around and talk about, hey, how do we how do we connect with with people that really are our road families that we've come to. Uh, used to being with and, and we haven't been with and maybe it won't be for a while so it's gonna be a really broad uh, set of topics i'm i'm kind of uh excited about that um we would encourage everybody that's that's listening today put in comments in in that question section um uh interact with us here because this isn't going to be powerpoint day with you know 12 steps to how to uh to to manage or anything else it's going to be a lot about dialoguing together and, and talking we'll talk tech we'll talk about um, uh, workflows we'll we'll talk about a lot of things and if you've got ideas um, uh, I would like to lead off before I go any further for those of you looking for Ed um, unfortunately um, Ed couldn't join us today um, which is a bummer uh, he does send his regards we're going to be doing another session um, uh, with Ed I promise uh, so please don't feel like I was dangling a carrot of head irons is coming on and and ah, that's not coming. No, it was um, it was just uh, one of those scheduling things that came up. So um, we're gonna we're gonna talk with him at at some point. So uh, please continue to interact with us here. Continue to um, uh, chat and and drop in your comments. Pete, good to see you. Um, here we are. Um, ready for another day. Um, I'm going to do, <clears throat> I'm going to do a quick intros and then Pete kind of walk us through the Q and A cause I saw some new names. Um, but before we go any further, I'm going to introduce, um, uh, uh, Ryan Lampa. He's new to, to practical show tech. Um, uh, Ryan, uh, and I were like everything in COVID, you know, everybody is meeting new people and i'm i'm proud to say that we got a chance to connect up and and ryan's kind of is a great illustration of somebody who's who's worked in a lot of different places you know he's he's been front of house and production uh manager for toby mac uh very well known um uh artist that uh love the music by the way ryan the uh my my boys are huge uh toby mac fans um and uh you know now he's head of uh live events for toby mac and so he's going to really deal with the business side of of balancing all this he's uh i think we'll all discover as as times go on that um uh we uh our, our jobs are going to evolve this this COVID post pandemic world, um, things are gonna things are gonna be different. But I think Ryan's gonna help us uh, see a lot of opportunities that they existed before COVID. They're gonna exist afterwards, and a lot of it's how we approach what we do. Um, Jim Yakabuski, obviously Yak was with us on the Smart session, and um, uh, you know really uh, glad to have you back, Jim. You know the the um, uh, you're you're not out mixing right now. Um, as we were talking pre-show, it's going to be a few more weeks probably. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, like everybody, Jim's also looking at opportunities. And I'll let you talk about that a little later, Jim, what kind of stuff that, that helps to keep your brain occupied when you're not behind the console. Um, Pete, enough talking for me for a minute. You got a question? Well, yeah, if you yeah. got a question. How do I ask a question, Pete? 
if you got a question uh, in the webinar control panel, there is a little section called questions. Just type it in there and we'll pass it on to uh, the, 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 the entire crew here. Uh, as we said on the, on the slide in the front, when you post a question, please repeat the idea which prompted it because we might not get to your actual question for 10 minutes or so because we're so involved in ourselves as most people usually are. Uh, uh, but uh, we're ready to go and uh, let's uh, hit the ground running. Remember, it, the bus just pulled up at 6 a.m. Get out of the bus, and let's go into the venue. There you, there you go. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna lead off with Ryan here because as, as from the production manager role, um, that 6 a.m. came along, but I'm pretty sure that bus just didn't happen to arrive with Pete on it, ready to um, get out there, do his RF scans and and be all busy. Um, let's talk about your workflow for a minute. You know, Ryan, when you were when you um, uh, were uh, uh, when you were um, having to be mixing and production managing. Uh, how did how did you balance? Let's just go with the question of what our whole topic was about. How did you find putting that work together? Where did you start? Sure, sure. So I, I think that, you know, a lot of us in the industry, I probably share the same uh, journey is that you, you somehow got in and you knew somebody that maybe knew somebody. And that person uh, for me was my little sister. <laughs> so I started off by uh, just jumping out on the road with my little sister. She, her name is Rachel Lampa. She's a, a singer, uh, an incredible singer. And so I jumped on the road and um, I was told that I was going to set up her merchandise. I was, gonna, I was told that I needed to make sure she got on stage on time and that she could use this uh, brand new technology called in-ear monitors to make sure that she had those and that she could use them. And so that was done. And I, I quickly learned that road managing or tour managing had a lot more uh, to it than just those three things. <laughs> but I jumped out there and that's where I started. Um, I, I realized that there was an opportunity for me to, to help with her sound quality. And so I completely faked it as her front of house engineer about show five, show six, we were doing uh, uh, outdoor festivals. And I was like, well, I can do this. And I, I'd done some DJing in high school. And so I had an idea of how to EQ and uh, I did not know what a high pass filter was. And so that was a, a rude awakening when I found out what happened when I turned that all the way down and the subs turned on and almost blew the place. <laughs> <laughs> but I continue to learn um, the hard way, and I asked a lot of questions, and I was I was um, blessed to have a lot of folks, uh, men and women, that I could ask a lot of questions to, and they, they answered them. Uh, and then so, uh, you know, I, I feel like God gave me an opportunity to just uh, no, but to say yes, and I'll figure that out. And so I feel like that was um, part of the, the beginning of, of, uh, of just learning. I dove into, I, I originally, right before jumping on the road, I wanted to be a, a movie mixer. I wanted to mix for Dolby sound. I just was uh, enthralled by, by, um, by Top Gun and how, you know, when the airplanes would come across, you know, left to right, that was one thing that really jazzed me up. And so I was like, I want to do that. But I want to do that with five speakers and a sub. And so... I almost went into that and then jumped on the road and just was like, man, I'm, I'm young. Let's hit the road. Um, so that's where I started. Um, okay. Again, I, I owe it to all the people that, that went before me and that I could ask questions to. And then, you know, gracefully, my sister really couldn't fire me all too easy. And so <laughs> she had to deal with all my mistakes along the way. Um, and all those concert goers, those concerts, Know, in the early days, I'm sorry. <laughs> I got better. I got better. I swear it. Uh, does that answer your question, Kelly? Well, yeah. That's that. That I think there was the first question of how we how we got into our business, which we learned through these webinars that everybody that is doing what they did today did not get into it to do what they're doing today. Um, yeah. That there is a natural. Yeah evolution that happens that uh we just go hey i discover this you know and and so when you were learning this because like so many people in the industry we're self-taught we didn't the university opportunities that we have today um didn't exist 30 years ago the same way um and and you talked about kind of learning on the fly so when 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 you had to do both things 
where where does the paperwork you know i i see a note here you know somebody was asking about you know master tour software and and you know obviously 20 years ago our opportunity was much different in how we worked paperwork wise and than what we have you know today how how did you what did you find was that information that you had to get across and how did you make it all work and find time yeah so it, it evolved you know the first uh, day sheet that i received was a word document and it really uh it was it worked it was fine it, it just it had everything i needed on it and I, I sent that out to the band and to the crew and everything was good um then it evolved into like excel sheets and I remember going, oh, wow, this is a lot easier to, to deal with. And I can make extra tabs and I can track things and put numbers in there. And then it evolved. A friend had shown me um, FileMaker. And so hmm. I dove headfirst into FileMaker. I was single at the time. I had tons of, uh, you know, uh, of my own time. And so I actually taught myself FileMaker and I made a giant FileMaker uh, uh, I don't know if you know what FileMaker is, but it's just like, mm -hmm. a, it's like, it's kind of like a matrix. You just make program, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. And so I, I made my own FileMaker and ended up making like a really great day sheet that had way too much information on it. But I had, you know, the, the mindset of, you know, answer all the questions before they're asked. And, 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 and hopefully that'll gain you 10 or 15 seconds here and there through the day. And so I could at least get lunch. And so that was the whole point is that I tried to answer all the questions before they were asked. So I could eat meals, you know, food <laughs> through the day because I felt like through the day, you know, you're just constantly answering questions. And then uh, Master Tour, the first uh, Master Tour database start, uh, came out and that was FileMaker based as well, which I thought was brilliant. It was awesome. Um, the first versions of it, I was really thankful for uh, until they crashed at times and I, we lost everything. <laughs> there was a few instances where syncing issues were happening and it's probably more user error than it was on the master tour side uh, but the latest iteration of master tour i think is awesome uh, for those that can afford it uh, i think it's a, a wonderful tool and it's actually it's awesome because you can kind of glean again off of the the folks that went before us where we uh, learn from the mistakes and learn from the great things and it's like it's been whittled down into this I mean, I can't find anything on there that I would want to add. And then when we want to add something, I just email my buddy that works over there and say, hey, what do you guys think about adding this? What about thinking about adding that? But before I can even do that, I feel like I get an update and it's like, oh, it's there. Um, and I, I realized too that, you know, I didn't want it to get too complex. I had a day sheet uh, that I had, had kind of designed to that FileMaker thing that I said, and I showed it to an artist that I just got hired onto. And he's like, wow, there's a lot of things on here. And I thought, yeah, okay, maybe I should filter out what the artist sees versus what the crew sees. And so I started to develop those sorts of things. And to be honest, I still in developing those, even not being on the road and coordinating information for those that are on the road. Um, I kind of custom make information for whoever needs to see it. Because you can imagine that certain people are like, man, I do not need to know about you know, uh, all the different uh, crew calls, you know, in the morning. I just need to know what time is sound check and what time is dinner. And so I, I learned that, um, you know, uh, customizing communication is really uh, important. If you don't do that, there's a good chance that there'll be people that are just gonna be like, I'm not gonna read that. And I'll just, uh, uh, you know, follow the sheep <laughs> to where I need to go. And, and most of the time that works and sometimes it doesn't. So yeah, I'll definitely say that Master Tour has been our go-to and that, built in with uh you know our own kind of customizable google docs um it, it's great because then um uh, you know we can all change in, in information you know on our team and communicate information and, and really lean into our people to be like hey contribute to this um because there's not a chance that uh one or two or even five people can cover all of the details that go into major concerts these days yeah and so jim do you have any you know um as as the the front of house guy right that that gets to interact you know I'll, I'll let you also put on your monitor engineer hat you know uh you know the um where where do you see um that dialogue you know are there are there questions like do you find um the challenges today even you know i don't want to i won't make you put any of the your coworkers on the spot you know in that but but where do you see you fitting in that in that phase, right? You know, if this is that, you know, this whole collecting and merging of information, you know, where do you where do you find your role into that? Yeah, well, I think you know, uh, like Ryan was saying, there's um, there's definitely 
uh, things that each department wants to see. I think as, as a, a crew overall, uh, crew information, you know, doesn't have to be departmentalized. I think it, it kind of works for everyone. What time sound check, what time's lunch. Um, uh, one thing that we would ask every day is, could someone just bring the day sheets out to front of house? Because, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, even if um, even if you have master tour, um, it was always great to have a paper copy that you could just kind of uh, gaff tape up uh, on a case out there. So it'd be like, hang on, what time are doors? When, you know, and we, and on the last tour, we had all these announcements that we had to do for uh, the, Sh the Shriners folks. They were giving away uh, guitars, uh, signed guitars and stuff. And, um, you know, if, if I could see all those things on a piece of paper, instead of having to pull my phone back out again and go, you know, back in, that always helped. So we would, we, you know, we would kind of contribute that, our thoughts, um, to our production manager uh, at the start, hey, this is great, but it would be also great to know this every day. And um, and I, I'm sure you can relate to that, Ryan, where where crew people, band members, well, even though you you've you've been doing it for years and years and years, it's like they go, you know, if, if you could put this one thing here, that'd be great. And you go, wow, that's genius. That I mean, I can't believe yeah. I haven't done that. You know, um, yeah, and. So I just think uh, I, th I think you don't ever want to have to look too far f for info. If it's if it's uh, oh, the other thing is accurate information. Sometimes things in in master tour will be done uh, you know three weeks uh, out or whatever, and if it doesn't get updated on the day of the show, you're like, oh, we're cool. Doors aren't for half an hour. Oh, sorry, they got moved up a week ago. And so either day sheet, master tour, you got to kind of find the one that, that you can trust and, and know that, uh, you know, there is, if, if they both sync, that's gold. But, uh, you know, sometimes I'll usually yeah. say, well, master tour might, this might've got skipped and missed, but the day sheet's always right. So I'll, you know, wait for that. Absolutely. You, you brought up an interesting point that I think in uh, which is around how much is how much information is too much information in a world where every piece of information is meant to be available, right? Where, you know, column after column after column and and trying to decide, like you said, where where is too much information and what's important to who, right? And and I think that's true of just everything in life where when you're managing people, you're managing projects, right? Um, uh, the Did you find, Ryan, that when, when you had the mix duties as well, right? So you've, you've gotten this information compiled, you got some great tools, you know, from the simplest beginnings to, you know, uh, online databases. Did you, you know, you, you must have felt some, pull all the time in a lot of directions. How did you decide, how did you make those mental priorities um, around, you know, those multiple tasks? Yeah, yeah, I would say that, you know, in my earlier years, you know, I started when I was 18 years old. And so through my twenties, I think when I, when I really got my, uh, you know, got some momentum in my career and I had access to a lot of different gigs, um, I feel like there was a season where I overcomplicated it a, a lot. You know, I, I threw in a lot of information. I mean, gosh, I would have like three day weather uh, packs on there and a quote for the day sometimes. And I just thought, oh, that's a cool thing. Oh, that's a cool thing. And there was a lot of things that were really important. Um, but I think what helped kept my head on straight was was simply saying, okay, what what have I come here to do? And what's my role? And what's my job? And what do I need to do that? And then to be able to filter through those things uh, as quick as possible, you know, the beauty of live shows is that you only get one take and that when it's, it's live, it's there, it's now. And in those moments, you can be focusing in on the show. Um, and I can even <laughs> recall because I would, I was, there was times where I was tour manager, production manager and front of house uh, <laughs> for a lot of gigs. Now, I remember there was times where the promoter would come to the front house console during the last three or four songs going like, hey, can we settle the show real quick? And I'm like, oh, my gosh. So I'm looking at an Excel sheet and learning to multitask. And it was like, this is crazy. I mean, I feel like I have the ability to do this, but something's going to pay. 
And so finding that priority of like, what's, what have I come to do? What do I need to do? And be happy to, to draw a kind boundary uh, around that too. Um, but keeping our head on straight, um, as far as information is concerned, um, I feel like, you know, when I would go just be a, a pure front of house engineer, I would be thinking for the, for the production manager and thinking, okay, how can I formulate this question to get what I need to get out of it and get out of the way? And so one of my favorite um, quotes would be uh, one of my friends that she, she's a, now an educator, but worked in the industry for a while. And her quote is, uh, be brief, be bright and be gone. And so I, I kind of I, I impart that upon my uh, students that I was teaching uh, just recently, uh, a college program with, uh, you know, music production and live production. And that, that's a key one. And I, I think that those of us that maybe have worked with teams um, in a live environment, you know, it's, it, we can be kind, but being brief and being bright and being gone, it, that's a form of respect, I think, for, for a lot of things that are happening, especially if there's a concert happening and you're trying to put out a fire. <laughs> That's a reason to be very like brief and bright and gone. And so I thought that that might be an idea too um, in regards to paper communication, you know, like back in the old days, like the, the day sheet was just written on a piece of paper and copied at a copy machine, you know, and it was just like <laughs> lunch, sound check, dinner, doors, show. And it's everything else is like, okay, you know what? Loadout's going to be when loadout's going to be. <laughs> you know, right. and if you really needed to know the exact time so you can have your callbacks for your hands, you can go find that and you can be bright and brief and gone uh, amidst all that. So I hope that, that answers a bit of your question. Yeah. One, and, of, the things that, one of the things that uh, I appreciated about the day sheet, at least on the tours I was on, was the order and location of the trucks during loadout. Hmm. And um, the, they would draw diagrams of all the loading docks and they would say, OK, it's going to be this truck, this truck, just so you'd know where it was. And it made all the difference in the world Absolutely. to know where, where you were pushing your stuff after the yeah. show. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I would say that, you know, every gig is going to be a little different, too. You know, oh, there's, yeah. totally. there's totally. times where you're just going to be like, and, and you'll, you know, by the, the second to last show, you'll have nailed it. You'll be like, I got it. We've communicated everything yeah. we need to communicate. Yeah. <laughs> but give them up to the, the sec at least the second to last show. Because the last show is different because everything's got to go to different trucks. So the second to last, exactly. day, that's when you got to peak. <laughs> I nailed it on that one. Yeah. So, so Jim, I, I, I guess the question I would pose to you based on, which I like, I wrote that down, the, the be, be, be brief, be bright, be gone, right? So now you're, as the front of house guy, you know, when you need to get what you need to get, because, you know, Obviously, you have the, the the benefit on a tour of of being kind of packaged up, right? The, both sure. both from from not just gear, but just that the idea of the everything you're going to do, you've the, they've gotten generally um, all all of the knowledge you need put in order, right? Whether it's right or not is, well, they say that's irrelevant. Um, but um, uh, we have a lot of info. How did you find, or how do you find getting what you need in those kind of conversations? What are, do you have any special tricks? <clears throat> are, are you talking more on a day-to-day -day basis with? Day-to-day -day basis, right? With your production manager, right? You yeah. know, when you need that, that special request or something's out of scope or just different than, than what everybody had discussed, right? Because right. that does happen. Well, uh, I'll I'll definitely re-emphasize kind. I mean, like, you know, and and I've never done your job, Ryan. I've I've been doing this 40 years, and I've never been that front of house slash production manager, or the other way around, probably more uh, production manager first. But um, so so I I've never been totally able to understand. Uh, what you know all the challenges you have and um I, I feel like when i come in with a problem um the be brief be bright be gone is f for sure i want to get it answered i try to i try to definitely get the temperature of the room when i walk into a production office you know um if everyone's chilling and having a little laugh and it seems like this is a light moment i'll always start with hey do you have a minute to answer this question instead of just you know barreling in there um and you know i've worked with some really really great people and everyone's patient and there's respect flowing both ways so so but i will try to 
get right to the point and um, ask my question and and try to try to make sure that um, you know I understand if if a plan has changed through the day like the artist wants to come in an hour earlier can you be ready those types of things um, you know you want to know that as as early as you can so uh, but I, I try not to hang out there too much and just you know just and especially if you want a couple guest passes for a show and uh, you want you want to go in and you want to ask that favor it's like okay it's seven days in a row for you now buddy like this is a little much so i you know i try to i try not to lean too much on um being too needy to the to the production manager and, and the whole team in there and when you say jim that that just takes time and 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 people in front of you just to kind of watch and learn that because i feel like you know when i was younger i had no idea and i would burst up in the po's and just blaze the whole place up with my sunglasses on and now you know, on the other side you just have to learn that and i think that there's like a decency that we can remember that we're a part of a team and that um, our fire is probably one of seven other fires going on at the moment and that uh in the end if nobody as long as nobody's getting physically hurt or or, or in, in sort of danger then you know we can we can approach most conversations with this speed of speech <laughs> yeah and this urgency and i think that there's you know there's there's wisdom that i that i learned early on with with bigger production managers that i was a, you know an opener on and i, I was like wow I, I really blazed the place and it, it took me many mistakes uh, of figuring that part out but to, yeah to even speak to what you were saying earlier kelly it's like Man, that being brief and being bright and being gone, it, 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 there's an art form to that. Um, but also there's, um, you know, it, there's, a, there's a blessing that I think a lot of us, maybe, you know, the way Jim has been talking about his previous gigs, you know, just working with wonderful people um, it, it is really key in that. And that we're not all blessed to have worked with really wonderful people as well. And so it's just as much of learning how to work with people as it is, you know, doing what we need to do technically. Sure. Yeah. So, so that's let's transition to the technical part, okay, for just a minute, because there are a couple interesting questions that have have come in that are around the mixing. All right, one question um, uh, uh, that came in was around FM and uh, mixing for outdoor uh, uh, events, and I think uh, uh, Ryan, you've you may have been uh, doing some stuff with with drive-in related stuff. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. can you, can you share a little, uh, background on that? Kind of like what, you, what you're doing there right now with that or, or prior? Yeah, totally. So it's a, it's a new concept to our camp. Um, as far as I know, it's a fairly new concept across the industry. Um, so we're kind of going out as a little bit of a guinea pig or part of the guinea pigs <laughs> to figure out these things. So I'll probably tell you, uh, better practices after we do our run, but yeah, we have, uh, with Toby, we have 12 shows that we're doing. Um, across the southeast uh, and east uh, at um, um, yeah, drive-in movie theaters. Um, we, we are relying heavily on the FM transmission, uh, the in-house FM transmission. And what I've learned um, so far is that there's actually a lot of great um, quality control in, in this industry with, with drive-in theaters. Um, from what I understand, there used to be thousands of drive-in theaters, uh, and it's dwindled down to a few hundred in, in our nation. And, and I think from what I've understood is that the, one of the biggest reasons is that there is a high uh, amount of quality control, both with the audio transmission uh, and with, you know, projector. Uh, uh, quality. And so, and we all realize, I don't know if we all realize this, but, you know, projectors are expensive. And so I think that the, what we're realizing now is that the, the actually quality is pretty high. Um, so we're doing in-house uh, FM transmission. There's no supplement supplementing that we're doing um, in bringing our, our our equipment in. We are supplementing with a small PA to just you know bring a bit of low end to you know some people's car systems, which I'd imagine that some people's car systems might be <laughs> supplementing our subs as well. But there um, we're going to have mains uh, a small uh, hang of mains and and possibly some wide throws as well. Um, uh, a very small stage, um, but yeah, we're just tying in left, right to their FM transmission, and, and we're gonna lean heavily into that. And so, you know, it's, it's more quick, of a- 
you know, because Good of question. safety concerns, staying in the car is the key. Yeah. Um, uh, so all of the FM was already existing in these venues you're going into in these drive-ins, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So yeah, you didn't all have the audio to get So that's any, their main way of uh, license or STAs or anything. You're not providing the FM stuff. That was a question from Jason Glass, who was trying to do that production for his clients and having a, a, a mm -hmm. very difficult time to, to meet the requirements to get a new STA oh, for yeah. an FM license. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you, yeah and I'm so, sure. do you or do you know what? model of FM transmitter they were using and did it give you really good high quality FM? I wish I knew. Um, I, could, I could try to send some text out while we're talking here and I can maybe answer that question but I, yeah, I don't was, know. That was the, the second uh, question because obviously you want to have the best quality yeah. out there. You don't want to have a noisy, noisy system. Sure. You know? Oh yeah, no we can't do that at all. But I will definitely, yeah. I'll send a text out right now. I'll see if there you go. I love that. Uh, this is live <laughs> webinaring, folks. That's, That's what we right, love folks. about this. Um, live texting. Yeah, we did, um, uh, 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 like, that's one of the things I love about like the DB Max processors from TC um, and the, the these FM processors that can go in line ahead for the for the audio. And, and I think, Pete, this transitions nicely to, to Dan's question uh dan daly had around the workload and jim i'm going to start with you on this um you know dan asked how is the increased need to record more live shows for distribution to fan sites affected you are you doing more mixes at shows and you know are you being compensated for this additional workload <laughs> uh so there you go i mean other than you know what kind of mixes are you having to put together or expecting yeah it's it's a great question um and throughout this entire session, uh, every time I try to sound like I have an increased workload, uh, Ryan just just kind of grin and chuckle at at me, the poor front of house guy with his increased workload, um, because yeah, my my day is not your day, and that's uh, I've been thankful for that. But <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's definitely a new thing. Uh, a couple tours I've been on, they've asked for um, uh, live mix and it's uh the the first time i did it we we were actually recording to a little mac computer right by front of house and uh it would just be a a left right uh right off the console and it would get recorded to a thumb drive and when the band finished their their full set before the encore uh this young girl would would pull that thumb drive out run up to the lobby and stick it in a replicator and they would just start just start making hundreds and thousands of these flash drives that would so so you would actually walk out of the venue with everything except the encore and then the encore you would get a code and you would go back and download the encore the next day um, that way if people wanted to leave at the at the encore break they could go and still get the show kind of thing so um, and you know I would always have uh, uh, groups set up if I needed to augment the mix but I would always start out by kind of saying um, you know every room's going to be different um, the amount of ambience that's going to get into the vocal mics and uh, certain drum mics and, and affect the way the mix sounds um, is going to be different every day it could be open air one day and you know Wembley Arena the next day you know just just really strange so um so i thought well i can try to guess throughout sound check how i'm gonna uh augment the record mix so it sounds the best it can but i started out doing uh the first week or so of shows just just recording straight off my left right and really critically listening uh to those and saying you know how how close am i getting are the vocals way too loud am i missing guitars is you know are things just really out of whack and and it seemed to go pretty well and you know a lot of that depends on having a stage volume that isn't crazy if you've got you know guitar amps and stuff on stage uh that are either you know isolated or modeled uh units like fractals and kempers and stuff that helps a lot but um if if you if you have a good mix in your console 
to, to begin with, you can usually get away with just the left and right. But I, I would have groups kind of ready and 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 effects on an on a bus as well to maybe um, add them. But I, I really found I didn't need to do that, and and that was that was a blessing. One of the other things that I uh, the other uh, situation I had was having to upload it at the end of the show. So that was always interesting. Like you know, what Wi-Fi, what venue Wi-Fi are you using to upload this big wave file at the end of the, the night? But um, uh, there was days where it just didn't work and I wouldn't even get it to the distributor uh, website folks till the next day, um, uh, especially if you got a 700 mile bus ride and you're you're trying to still get this thing uploaded to the uh, distributing company. But uh, but it's uh, you know it's a little extra workload and and yes I would try to cut a deal at the start you know I've got this extra bit of stuff so um, and and you know it 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 wasn't a lot extra but I'd get paid for my extra time so so um, Ryan and one of the questions we'll stay on this FM thing for just a minute because that's uh, we see a few questions coming in around that one is um, uh, the do you do you do a dedic since you were talking about a small PA augmenting that are you are you generating a separate mix or are you guys thinking you'll probably just you know do the same mix everywhere any any thoughts or any special processing that was another question that came in I'm kind of putting all that together here but um, you yeah. know do you see a different workflow for that now going forward because it's probably going to be pretty popular. <laughs> Yeah, totally. So we're setting, you know, front of house pretty close to the stage. Um, no need to make it, you know, 90 to 100 feet from the stage because we're not really shooting to throw that far. A lot of these venues are going to be really wide uh, where, you know, we just can't carry enough PA uh, to, to cover it uh, well. So again, we're leaning more into the FM transmission. So I think part of the idea is to have multiple monitoring, monitoring uh, opportunities where, you know, we can have uh, somebody, you know, having uh, an FM receiver uh, to be able to, you know, pop some headphones in, or maybe even have somebody checking in with cars or checking in with, with, the, with the crowd as we're going. Um, but also, you know, just relying heavily on, we're gonna do one mix, we're not gonna do multiple different mixes, uh, but I think there, you know, we'll be playing around, and again, it's gonna be a real time thing. I feel like we're a bit of a, a guinea pig. We'll be playing around with whether we need to hit uh, any kind of uh, compression uh, beforehand. But I know that in, you know, in most uh, radio, you know, scenarios where we hit FM transmission, there's usually um, a good amount of processing uh, beforehand that's sort of built in. So what I would imagine, and this is what I'm hoping for, is that, you know, the same uh, processing that a movie would, uh, would probably be using uh, would be uh, the same that we would use. And I, I wonder uh, how many of the presets we can actually, you know, uh, manage, you know, if there's a long, you know, release time on the compressor. Oh, man, we might be in trouble, but I wouldn't imagine that would be, you know, I think that, that it would be a pretty uh, a quick squash uh, is what I would imagine before it hits FM. And it's funny. I mean, I don't know if, about you guys, but, you know, I, I grew up on uh, an FM radio uh, well before, you know, CDs and tapes and stuff. And there's something about FM compansion and expansion that I actually kind of like <laughs> personally. So I'm actually looking forward to hearing it. And I know with Toby, he said that in the past too. He's like, man, you know, you listen to a, a mix on, on a CD and then you, you hear it through the radio and you're like, man, I kind of like the radio version. Even though it's the same mix, it's just going through a bunch of crap and getting spit back out. Uh, I've always enjoyed FM. I don't even know if that's the right word, compansion, I guess, or expansion. Well, yeah, yeah, companding. Um, the, it's interesting. Okay. I was um, I was mixing a service for my brother-in-law this weekend. They did a drive-in. So he's like, hey, can you got any leads on being able to set up a radio station right so i'm like sure called in a couple favors and i carry this db max box with me from tc electronic i swear by this box because it's got settings for streaming fm stereo fm mono all kinds of things and it's multi-band compressor right and and it also will act as a normalizer it's built on the finalizer um so it takes your your ref input in my case i use minus 20 dbfs and that's my ref uh, very similar to just a broadcast setup. And then it maximizes my output level because obviously in FM, FM modulation, right? We, we, we can't go too big. Otherwise we're out of compliance with the FCC. And I had a 
part 15 transmitter. So Jason, yes, I was legal. I stayed under the legal limit that a part 15 license allows me for. But um, I, I was, I had some FM Walkmans, right? Because on a corporate show, that was how we used to cue all of our, uh, all our drivers, right? So I had like 60 Walkman radios. So I grabbed one of those and I was mixing the show on the Walkman. And it was really interesting. Yeah, it was a service. There was nothing highly technical about it. But I had my VP88 with the birds chirping in the background, right? Because they also had a live stream going on. So it's kind of fun to just live in a world that I hadn't listened to in a really long time. But I will tell you, I'm not a salesman for TC Electronic, but I am saying they're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> they, those boxes work phenomenal. Um, but this is that new world we're back into where the old is new again. And um, uh, I think you're on to something. I would definitely encourage you to, to um, uh, look into that, that um, FM processing that most of those stations are using with the multiband compression because I had really good performance from that. Um, uh, one, one technical question about delaying your PA. Yeah. That Where was going to be my optimize question. Optimize it for the FM. Yeah, we're going to have to do that real time because uh, you know we don't know if there's going to be a, a major amount of latency. So we're going to have to do that real time, and we'll see how their processing is acting. Well, it depends on how their, many people uh, come. Come, the people in the pickup sitting in the back row of the audience are going to have a really strange yeah. audio. Yeah. Yeah. If it's a well, deep, if it's a deep audience, it'll be it'll be odd for sure. Yeah, you and need, there'll you be, uh, get, you know, we'll be you need to get about six different again, channels to more, them and have them tune into the right one. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Um, that's a, that's so a this great is the, point. The text actually. That I just got. Yeah, that is a good point. Um, oh, wow. Uh, so they're still slowly gathering information. Um, the frequencies are going to be right around 88.9, it sounds like. That sounds like the. Uh, they're going to try to get to right and most the, are a half watt mm -hmm. that's a half watt transmission he is he did say that it's interesting that they the inputs are are, are looking like most of them are going to be rca inputs yeah <laughs> yeah really so i'll tell you good bridging transformers low, low make pro. all the difference yeah yeah, um, absolutely that, yeah. Uh, another one of my buddies called me up he's like man i can like barely crack this i'm like get yourself a couple bridging transformers coming out you know and Boom, fixed all that signal to noise. Yeah. Uh, Tim McCullough dropped in here, the Orban Optimod. That's a, you know, that's the high end of the spectrum for FM uh, uh, transmission processing, but um, uh, it's a, uh, um, uh, a, a great, great product. Um, let's see, hey, Pete, I see some questions have come in back to the paperwork. So let's, let's catch those real quick while we're here. It's not so much paperwork, but it's, um, uh, well, let's see here. The, the Paul Bevan was asking an interesting one, which I always wondered. You get all these writers that come with, with from bands and stuff like that, and a lot of time they aren't reality. I bet you find it. They'll walk in and and give you a writer. Well, that was the one we used three weeks ago, but we have different things. Is any proactive part you do to to confirm this is the real writer? Yeah, there's an like, easy way to do that. You, you just text them and say, away. are you kidding? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I don't necessarily throw them away, but I hear what you're saying. And even with me being a production manager and advancing with others, um, there's times where the agency has an old production writer. Um, so what I've actually been doing uh, for the past, I don't know, six or seven years, is I'll, I'll say, you know, we have a, a basis of our writer. Um, but all the particulars that usually change would be like backline list, input list, stage plots, that sort of stuff. Um, I'll say at the end of that, uh, to be determined. And and, and normally a, a lot of uh, promoters will still be able to sign the contract on that. Um, but you know, and then it, or or it'll get it'll get halted. It'll say, oh, I need to. So see it's like a reverse reverse writer. You're saying this is what we're going to give you. Yeah, or more so that it's it's it it stops the train, and so then they bring somebody like me into the conversation, and they say, "Hey, what's the updated rider, or what's the updated you know input list and stage Because it's really those things that are the major changes. You know, if you're doing a major tour, you're going to call in advance anyway. 
Um, and, and I feel like, you know, it, it, for the touring scenario, it, you're probably not going to be recycling too much of your production side of your rider, but on the, uh, on the summer festivals or, you know, state fairs, you know, that sort of stuff, for sure, that stuff can be recycled easily and, and that'll get caught up in whatever business side of things. And I'm not blaming any agents at all. They do a lot of great work, um, uh, but it's more so on the side of, of like, oh gosh, we changed uh, yep. snare size. And, you know, we showed up and like, oh, the snare is not the right size. Well, this is the this is the rider we're going off of. And I was like, I was so tired of that happening. I was like, okay, I'm not giving you anything anymore. And then you're going to have to ask for it. And then when you ask for it, uh, I, give, I give you the updated one. If I gave you the outdated go. one, yeah, yeah. you know, then it's my fault. You know what I'm saying? And I would also say on top of that, that for me as a production manager, when we have, you know, opening bands or, you know, we produce a lot of big tours where we have, you know, six or seven different bands. Um, I don't even ask for the writer. I call and I schedule or I'll schedule a meeting and I'll say, let's just sit down and I have my, my things to fill out. What yeah. client are you, what risers are you needing? And just, let's just have a conversation about it because in the sure. end, if we're going to, if we're going to start like being like, well, the writer says this, it's like, we're starting off on the wrong foot. I feel like let's, let's try to build a rock and roll show. That's awesome. And what you need and what you want instead of what you prepared six or seven months. Have have you planned on uh, your own FM confidence monitoring um, in each show? So you're listening to what's really there. Yeah, or? yeah. We, I mean, we're we're talking through it. We'll probably carry a, a few different, uh, you know, reference monitors within front of house. You know, obviously we'll have the PA. We'll have a few different reference monitors. I think in these situations, I love having different. I'm not going to be doing the mixing, uh, but a guy named Pat Happening is going to be doing the the mixing, and he's incredible. And I think that he's going to bring probably two or three different types of monitoring where you know tiny speakers maybe you bring a little car speaker uh you know that that we can kind of you know emulate uh and then headphones um, i think are going to be a great thing to to rely on but i know that you know me being in my position we'll be sending you know chosen folks to go tapping on windows hey my name is so and so i work with the tour just checking in to see if your audio is sounding yeah, good yeah. um you know, i think that that's going to be the best way to do it um there is going to be a little bit of a user, you know, interaction too, you know, with, yeah, yeah, with, yeah. I think some folks even with their own stereos. Yeah. yeah, I ran into that Sunday myself. They couldn't figure out how to tune their radios. <laughs> they actually only yeah. knew how to use the seek button or whatever the five buttons were, right. you know, <laughs> yeah. that they were free programmed. And then like, you think I'm about all the different frequency. EQ settings on everybody's stereos. I'm like, oh, right. Boy. So, yeah, it's, you know. it, but it was much it's more good. hands on there. Um, yeah. You know, so, um, uh, you know, and uh, let's see here. Um, uh, Paul also just expanded on, uh, I just want to, for the one question with regards to the paperwork, right? Um, Jim, you do a lot of fly dates, um, you know, the corporate world where, you know, I get a lot of people come in and I'll get that paperwork that is the, you know, oh, 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 oh yeah, that was the last guys paperwork and and here's some tweaks are there any things that we could do differently without i mean i know that when you're out on tour and like i know from my experience uh i'm doing a special event and in come all these acts who now the the front of house guy that was their dark day and it's no longer their dark day and they may right. or may not be getting compensated <laughs> the same way uh, I don't, I never asked that question, but the paperwork's a big deal to me because I'm trying to be prepared. Uh, you know, when you walk in, it's like, Hey, it's a fly date. I've got all your stuff ready to go. Now, a lot of that times I find things like, like Paul mentioned here that things get hung up, whether at the promoter or whether at that venue, is there, is there any special tricks? You know, am I being that big, you know, POA guy that, you know, I'm sending you a note, Hey Jim, I really need this paperwork right or hey i'm not seeing that and i know you said that it came through so and so um you guys got any suggestions on that or you know do i just keep knocking on doors and be brief be bright be gone <laughs> yeah I, I i definitely think that you need to ask for sure and expect to get and if you don't get ask again um but uh, you know, my when I'm advancing a bunch of shows, let's say I'm carrying a front of house console and um, mics and stands and snakes, but we're picking up PA every day. 
in a venue. My, my, um, I'll, you know, I'll build a big Excel sheet for all my advancing, and um, and and one of the things that I always ask for is uh, I'll send out a, sort of a welcome email, and I'll say, hey, we're we're coming in on this date. We're carrying this. This is what we require. And then I'll say, please email me back with with answers to my questions first, and then we can have a conversation because what, what I'll so often find is I'll reach out to someone and uh, I'll be driving in my car and they'll call me back uh, 30 minutes later and say, Hey, let me tell you all about the PA. And, you know, and I'll say, well, please send me an email. Oh no, it's quicker just to do it on the phone. And, you know, and I'll say, well, I've got 30 shows coming up and by the time I get back to my desk at home, I'm not going to remember any of this. So, um, so I, I, I like to uh, get all that info. This is what's in the venue, or this is what's we're bring, what we're bringing in, and then put it in my Excel sheet, and then send that reply email that says, uh, "Okay, so regarding the subs, can we set them up in a cardioid configuration? Is that possible? You know, and I'll go through my list of things. Um, but from the end of being, um, you know, like on a corporate event where you're maybe the A2, but you have an entertainment night. And uh, as part of the sound company, you want to get the answers from the artist. Um, if if you're not getting it, I certainly say knock on that door several times. And if you don't get any answer, then you got to start going up the food chain and trying to get somebody to hold that audio team accountable to get you the information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, again, that goes back to communication. You know, Ken Newman just reiterated that here. Communication is key. Having that 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 dialogue with the the right people, ideally the sound people. Um, I think you brought up an interesting point, Jim, that is important, and that is getting things in writing. Um, it's not so you can be like in that old, you know, the the Patriot Games movie where you know the guy from the CIA pulls out that piece of paper from the safe and goes, "You have one of these." Right. You know, it's not a it's not that, hey, I'm trying to prove you wrong, but I want to get the details right. Yeah. And and a lot of times that communication via email is really important to that and not just, you know, leaving it lay there. Um, Carter made an interesting. You know, I would always put an expiration date on a writer. That way the recipient would know right away that they had an outdated writer. So nice we're hoping people read them. Right. Yeah. Um, but, is that our friend uh, Carter Hassebrook that asked that question? Is. Hey, Ryan, look at that. Look at um, that. What's that? Carter Hassebrook had that last question. He, he, uh, oh, yeah. Statement. Yeah. <laughs> the great uh, Carter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would say, too, one thing I would add to that last question is, um, you know, a lot of times we're going to be looking for or seeking information, and we're just not going to get it. And so I remember being in that place, whether it was a production manager, you know, calling that opener that was supposed to show up and they just couldn't get it, whether they did the personnel to communicate that or they just were terrible at communication. Um, and whatever, whatever reason that might be, um, I started to just go like, okay, well really what could change? What's gonna be the major changes? And I used my experience and just, you know, reasonable thinking and then maybe even YouTube and like, you know, Googling and go like, all right, well, I see that last week they carried, you know, these many background singers or they, they carried, you know, this or they, they needed that. And like, you just kind of do the best that you possibly can, build in a few extra channels and then maybe even make it into a festival situation. So you're not just hosed where you're like, they show up and you're like, well, I didn't get any of your information. Uh, it's be like, well, I didn't get any information, but I did some thinking and I did some research and it looks like X, Y, Z. At least you can be a little bit that far, more far ahead. So a lot of the students, you know, I would work with, you know, I would have them do, um, input lists you know on, on all their bands every single week we would do a concert every single week and I, and, I, and I would quiz them about seven or eight weeks into it I'm like okay show me what's changed between all of these input lists and really the only thing that major that are major changes are going to be the amount of vocalists the amount of drums um, but you know in the end you can pretty much fit a lot of things into a festival input list where you have drums bass guitar keys tracks vocals and extra stuff you know, like whether that be a cello or a glockenspiel or whatever it is, but it's always works within that stuff. And so I think, you know, sometimes we can work ourselves into a little bit of a tizzy when we're like, we don't get, we haven't gotten all the information where you could just as much go, all right, I'm not getting the information. 
So I'm going to make it. I'm going to create it myself and I'm going to do the best that I can. And then you can air back on like, well, I didn't hear anything. So I made this. And at least you're that far ahead. Right. Well, that's interesting, the, the way you put that, because that that's part of what we were talking about, finding that that attitude or vibe. You know, we talked about this uh, pre-show a lot and we, we bring it up a lot on the webinars about, you know, what is that? What is that communication style you choose to have with people? And, you know, the, the importance of being overly prepared. Um, you know, I had one person that says, I'd rather have no information than wrong information. I said, okay, <laughs> I sort of get that. I said, but what if all yeah. I have to offer you is wrong information? Okay. So would you like <laughs> some or none? Right. And, and I get that. I, 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 I respect those, those that you know where people are like well i don't want to be given uh i know when working internationally i would never send out my information until the very last edit because mm -hmm. inevitably whatever the first version is that you send is the version that everyone works from nobody seems to nobody seems to to go oh you know oh there was version three of this so um uh, as as we're doing that, this it's that attitude though, right? And if that bothers you, then you have to go and find probably that environment that fits a little better with your vibe, right? With, um, you know, Jim, I, I would assume that you found that working with a lot of different groups that you found that place where you dug how they work, they dug how you worked. And then other ones were like, okay, I can do any gig once. And it's like, no thanks i'm kind of busy or um you know um let, let's just kind of take that into our attitude discussion right and the leadership because ryan your 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 job is to lead when you're a production manager you know when you walk in that morning how how do you set the tone on on a on a day you know if you're up or you're yeah. down yeah totally i would say that you know for me on a touring scenario or even with uh, with the festival scenario, uh, I try to make it as predictable as possible, as much as as much as we can. You know, there is a lot of different um, chaotic points with what we do, but there's also a lot of very common points. And so, like in, in for for an example, on the on like the like say arena touring scenario, um, every single morning we would do a walkthrough, and and it would start at the same place every single venue so it'd be the downstage left corner and you know i set the expectation with the promoter i made sure and this is just something that i do it's not like you know the best way to do it it's just a found the best way that we found that works for us um, is that we meet the promoter a venue representative um and the, you know front of house uh, uh systems tech uh, and then most likely lead rigor and then maybe somebody that's with the design so that we just have a quick powwow and i uh, i I guarantee that you know, with with working with the venue, that I have the latest sold chart and latest uh, uh, you know um, tick sales, you know, highlighted sold chart, um, so we can look at it. Okay, these are where the seats are. This is where we're going to point to the speakers. Ooh, this is going to be an issue with sight lines over here. We just have that conversation first thing in the morning. That's before anybody's had any breakfast. So we have to time that with load in, and sometimes you know, with long drives, it's tougher to do. But for the most part, we we, we were able to achieve that meeting. And when you have enough heads in there where they were talking, we're drinking coffee together going, oh, okay, oh shoot, didn't think about that or didn't see that or check this part out. And there's, you have enough people into that conversation and you get used to that rhythm of things. Um, you kind of establish your uh, kind of your cadence uh, for the day. And then you build it off of, uh, okay, I learned this today. Next, tomorrow, I'm gonna start bringing this into the conversation. And just kind of, and over time and experience, you just learn. Okay, these are going to be the seven things that we're going to cover this morning. And you all also want to make sure you're not covering too many things. You're like, these are the bare essentials for right now. And then after everybody's had some breakfast or after everybody's had some lunch, then we'll talk about these parts. And then I found too that you know you delegate that meeting out too, where you know me as a production manager, um, you know we talk through all of those the, the little things, the, the things that always are an issue. You know, sight lines where we didn't think about, ooh, the subs stack up this high, didn't think about the elevation of those seats over here in the corner. Um, that to like front of house placement and making sure we mark that off. And we're like, okay, the chairs go here, front of house bike rack goes here. 
these things go there always is an issue you know you always get a call at two o'clock in the afternoon like oh we don't have enough room to put our front house it's like oh gosh so you know you're constantly learning those things and then it's very tour specific as well and then right after that we delegate out okay the venue um representative would can walk our, our road manager or tour manager down to go look at dressing rooms you do all of that stuff the same thing every single day and again adding on the little nuances per your per your tour or per your act or, or however you guys roll um in, in real time i think is is the best way that i've found to do it so um, you know, you mentioned that you you work with, you know, you have students that you're working with, you know, training, you know, getting these kind of things. What are the things you're looking for then, you know, when you're when you're evaluating crew members? Are you are you basically saying, hey, here's the vendor we're using for this tour, or you know, obviously it's a little different than a fly date where you're you know you know you're using whoever is there. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about you know as people are reimagining getting back to work and, and doing shows. Um, we won't have been yelling at each other for the last six, eight months. And I'm not really interested in having, walking back into a job site and kind of working up to that immediately. What are you looking for in team members, you know, when it's, when it's you selecting people around you? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, on the on the entry level side, I'm looking for the people that are willing to just jump, jump in and the ones that are there. You know, I think that there's a uh, it, it's it's very simple to me. I can see it, you know, I don't know, maybe it's just the experience that I've had or I don't know the, the, the amount of young folks that I've been be able to be around. But it's it's very clear on who is activated and who is like, I'm just here. And, and, and it's actually, there's a lot fewer people that are actually fully activated. And so I'm looking for those folks that are fully activated, fully realizing, oh, wow, this is an opportunity. Because it's every second that's the opportunity. It's not just when you're behind the console. It's also when you're having lunch and when you're walking down a hallway and to see how they, uh, you know, talk to people and communicate. And if they can understand the concept of being bright, being gone, you know, <laughs> and breathe. You and really so want to... Oh, we lost you there, Ryan, for a second. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I think that there's, there there's a key uh, point in realizing. Oh, you're still losing me? We got you you're now. Back. Okay, cool. So, I'm not sure exactly where it cut off, but I think that having, uh, you know, a keen eye looking out for those that are wanting to stay activated and realizing that they're sort of on the clock uh, through the whole interaction here. You know, like and part of that is you want people that are that are uh, uh, positive, even when they just got off a three hour bus ride where they didn't get any sleep and they walk yeah. in and they are not grumbling all the time. Yeah, because we can have the best, you know, whatever it is, front house engineer, lighting director, um, any of those folks, you can have the best one in the world. Um, but if they're uh, a, a potential to bring down the whole ship, and I don't know if that's a price that we're willing going to pay and mm -hmm. we have to gauge that and obviously there's sometimes we guys say okay we'll make a little bit of an exception here because they're really good at this part <laughs> you know but i think that for the most part we're, we're always looking for sustainability uh because you know you're living on an island every single day uh you're going to a venue and it's not like you can just fire your front of house engineer on the spot and then just find another local front of house engineer for I mean, there's some gigs that can afford to do that I've been on some of those in my earlier days, but not mm. so much anymore when you're on these, mm. you know, large scale, well rehearsed, you know, concerts. Um, I would say uh, uh, in addition to that, it's just a willingness, a general willingness. And I know that this sounds very rudimentary and, you know, basic. Of course, it's going to say willingness, but, you know, there's a real big difference between somebody that's like, yeah, and, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll dive in there and whatever needs to be done and really knowing that and feeling that in your soul versus like, yeah, I guess I'll do that. You know, or I guess I'll do that. Or I don't know, is there any extra pay for that? It's just, there's a difference between someone saying, I'm, I'm ready to jump in, like show me where I need to go, especially right now. I'm talking to, you know, crew members on both sides of the, of that spectrum where some are just like, dude, whatever, man, whatever I need to do. And others that are like, I guess, and you're like, man, I'm not excited to put the, I guess, uh, you know, on the next one. It makes me think twice. 
you know, to really fight, you know, to, to, to put you in a position to either make more money or to be upgraded in your position when you're, when it's constantly like, oh, I guess, you know, and that, and that kind of mindset can be handed down to us. I understand that, but we have to be taking a self check and be like, am I the grumpy crew guy that I used to watch when I was younger? I'd be like, why are you so grumpy? You have your job of your dreams. And then, oh crap, I'm that guy. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I've definitely hit those points, and I ask my friends. I'm like, "Am I the grumpy crew?" You know, they're like, "Well, today you are." <laughs> and I'm like, "Okay, you have to go outside, go look at the sun, take a deep breath." Um, but that's where our friends come in. You know, on the road, you have to be constantly asking, "Am I that guy?" And we can't afford to do that. You know, the way that we're getting into this uh, new season of business, there's a lot of people chomping at the bit that are going to say, I'm ready. There's a thousand of us. There's a thousand of me, production managers, front of house guys, whatever, that are really good and they're really hungry. And so the competitive side of this is going to be, a, it's going to be greater in, in, in what I see. And so we just have to be, we have to realize that it's not the older, old, old days where it's like, I'm awesome. So you better hire me. It's more like, oh crap, there's like a bunch of awesome people and, and, and I'm like on the list. Does that make sense? Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, and, and Jim, you know, having just, you just wrapped up a tour, right? And um, I, when you were- a few months you know, ago. I, I know. Uh, yeah, that was actually, wasn't it? Wow. We started this whole COVID, let's park <laughs> it here um, now two and a half months ago. Um when you were when you were looking at that team, have your thoughts changed at all between say, you know, what what your how you manage your team or what you're looking for six months ago versus today? And it's okay to say nothing's changed, you know. Um, I just you have any thoughts on this or when you're putting together your next tour, right? Right. What you know, obviously we know that 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 vendor has has a very big role in that, but the the teamwork the synergy you have is really important yeah yeah it, it's like uh <clears throat> you know it's like we were saying you discover artists through the years that you go man i just i just know i'm going to go on that tour and it's going to be good people good vibes good positive energy i will do that tour every time those guys go out because i know it's not going to be a bunch of um i you guess so people you want to have fun there's no sure. point in going out and and being in a negative way. I mean, I, I, on at least on one tour I was on, within a week of us starting, somebody was let go because they were just grumbling all the time. They yeah. were doing a great job, but they were not fun. Yeah, and that's and as Ryan said, it's going to be key. Um, so so if I have to recommend, you know, let's say it's a tour where. We, we want you as the front of house engineer, but um, do you have any names you can put forward for monitors, uh, system person, uh, PA tech, monitor tech? I'm going to put forward names of people who I know have that great attitude. They yeah. work hard. And that is going to get it's, it's going to get tougher because, um, yeah, you can't you can't just show up here in the next year. You're going to have to. You're gonna to have to show up and have a great attitude, or there's someone waiting to replace you. Yeah, um, including, including me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, by the way, um, <laughs> we mean to talk to you about that, Jim. Um, <laughs> but the here's a question I have. It, it hasn't come in, but um, uh, Ryan, I'll start with you on this one. The do you see the same way you're doing the drive-in? Do you see a streaming experience? becoming something the live streaming of, of every event i understand that there's a lot of other legal things and there's there's a lot of parties involved here but just as a bigger picture um what we're planning for technically you know we talked about fm being a little different listening experience and probably going to have a different chain of of processing maybe streaming if that becomes more standard as people as all these labels are looking for ways to maximize um what are empty rooms and buildings um do you have any thoughts on that sure yeah i mean i think there's a little bit of it that's uh to be determined 
I would say definitely in the places of worship, you know, I, I think that, I don't know, in, I was listening to a podcast the other day and, and a lot of these church leaders were saying that if you don't have a streaming, you know, set up that you're behind on the times and that um, you shouldn't be surprised if there's a decline. Uh, and so I think that in places of worship or those sorts of um, programs, definitely having a streaming outlet, uh, I think is an absolute must. Um, I do see um, even, you know, the, the corporate world of, uh, of doing seminars or conferences at that. I had my first uh, virtual conference and I thought it was wonderful. Um, I sat on my couch and I watched the whole thing. It was really great. Um, and I think that that technology will, will continue to get better on that front. Uh, I wonder if there's going to be a lot more of that. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, I'm talking to other colleagues, um, both in the country and the Christian realm and rock realms. There's a lot of folks that are just saying like, hey, you know, 2020 it doesn't look so good for touring for a lot of folks. And they're just going to uh, hit pause and, and wait till the spring of 2021, if not beyond. Um, and I don't hear uh, much of the energy going into, yeah, we're going to start, you know, live streaming concerts. So I think the hard part is that you know, if you think about it, you know, that might take away from the value of the live concert. Where people are like, oh, we'll just right. watch it on TV or watch it on my laptop as opposed to going to the concert. So I think people are going to be a little reluctant in, in broadcasting a product um, that, you know, it could cheapen it, cheapening the product, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. but again, I think that there are going to be some really cool advancements, even with uh, with community aspects of sharing and chatting and communicating. You know, we've seen watch parties, you know, pop up. We've seen the Netflix parties kind of pop up. Those sorts of things where people are communicating while watching and they're not even in the same room. Um, but man, I personally, I think that concerts will be protected. It might just be a little bit more time, a little more time. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like it. There's, you know, that's why we do what we do, because when the house lights go out and these people have been waiting four months to see the show, it's their favorite artist. There's 10, 15,000 people there. There's nothing like that. There's no way you can recapture that. I mean, you know, really, really good filmmakers and, and um, directors and producers of live concert events can can capture that moment at a great venue with a great band but to try and do that night after night or multiple uh you know w without the crowd i mean we've all i don't know if everyone's checked out a uh, a nascar race in the last couple of weeks but to see those cars flying around there with no people in the stands it's just it's still car racing but it doesn't feel quite right so um so I, I think i think you're right ryan we're we're all waiting and we'll wait a little longer if we have to to not cheapen the product yeah that yeah. visceral experience um you know to your nascar example you can't even hear the crowd right i mean, can't even hear the crowds over the cars <laughs> right but it's such a visual so now take that to a concert setting where can you imagine an artist that's so used to having the feedback of that crowd, right? What? Well, okay, we could put a big PA up and pipe in people cheering. It's not going to happen, right? Because that does not have the same experience, and that's just for your 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 main talent. You know, now flip that around to the other twenty five thousand people that are there to take it all in, right? So, um, you know, that's, I, I think you're you're right on there. I think, you know, everybody's so quick to say, we're gonna stream everything and not everything's gonna stream. The stuff that is though, is gonna have to be really good. Like you said, Jim, um, you, you won't be able to, if you choose to say, hey, I'm gonna create a moment for an experience. Well, then it better be a really, really good experience, right? Um, <laughs> uh that's uh uh to to do that um um yeah one of the ken newman just made a, a note about that it will be interesting to see what kind of audience reaction happens even at drive-ins right because we're yeah. fixing a moment right and i think people people are so hungry right now that we're yeah. on, what you're doing there is the right answer right for people to go i need 
I need to experience something and I understand the trade-offs I'm making to have that experience. Whereas with streaming, you're, you, you go, well, no, I'm not, I don't want to give up that experience. I'm at home. I watch movies. I watch feature films. I, you know, the, you know, we, we talked about that Pete with uh, NBC, you know, Carl Malone and the immersive audio 5.1.4, right. To, to create, and that's for a football game, right? So musically, we're um, while I think a lot of people want um, want things um, being able to have that experience, as Jason noted here, sight, sound, smell, touch, taste, all of that is what you're paying for. That's that price of entry is all validated through the experience that I had. Um, but um, Jim, I think your mixes and and obviously Ryan's front of house person will be under extra scrutiny perhaps for a while because it not in a bad way, but hey, we want to repurpose this mix for something else, right? So I think there's going to be opportunity to create um, help create content that's used very narrowly. Um, uh, but it also means everybody's going to be listening to you in a way that maybe they hadn't, and then they'll get back into getting really drunk and really enjoying the music, right? Um, lots of, lots of multi-tracking. That's what you need. And then, uh, you know, yeah. a little fixing up later. Yeah. Um, you know, the, um, uh, being able to do it well, um, you know, I, I saw here in one of the questions, um, Edward was just kind of pushing back where he disagreed that you couldn't have a good live experience and these things, but um, we're, they also are going to have to invest the resources. I, I think when you look at like what Springsteen's talking about and, and these other things, you're going to have to have those resources if you do that. Now, will it replace? I, I think the, the point we were talking about is it's not going to replace touring for 2020. Um, and certainly not going to replace touring for 2021, but I can certainly see people saying, Hey, here's a new revenue stream. And right. It's uh, going to be a this plus, you know, I, I know I mentioned to everybody, they're probably tired of hearing this, but in addition to everybody having their job plus one, uh, we're going to be seeing, hey, this was our business model plus something else. We're going to add, we're going to have to add a little branch off right here. And that's going to mean a little more work. And that's good, I think, um, on that front. Um, the uh, um, I don't think I have any more to say there. I think I'm kind of rambling. Um, uh, we kind of got through that point. Uh, I would like to talk about, uh, as we're starting to wind down, I like to talk about community uh, for just a minute. Um, uh, I've been trying to, I had a very sleepless night last night, um, thinking about what's going on around us and how, how to, how to realize not just the challenge, you know, there's so many challenges, you know, we've been, we think about it within our industry, right? So I'm kind of seeing, I'm going to put it out there and, and I'm, I'm not looking to have people make any outlandish statements, but rather we have our community that's our road family, right? That I haven't seen for a very long time. Um, basically, I, I was thinking through last night, most of the people that I work with, um, I spend more time collectively with than my my natural family, right? So they're very important to me uh, on different levels. Um, and that's where I found my community, but I haven't been out with my community for the last three months. Um, the, as we're, unfortunately, we're gonna be going on a little longer um, with this, um, with our shutdowns, um, our business, even if we could all get together tomorrow, our business isn't gonna just instantly flip a switch and three weeks from now we're, we're doing what we were doing. So knowing all of that, um, <clears throat> where, where do we find some opportunity this summer to, to, to do service to our community, to our, whether that community is, is our industry, or our greater community of, of 
people um, around us that we actually live with. Um, I know that's kind of a big, broad statement. And, and Ryan, I'll, I'm going to start with you on that because I know what you're doing in Nashville with with the homeless um, uh, and and your nonprofit. But what are you what are you sensing right now or some opportunities for us to do? Yeah. So just briefly, you know, I'm part of an organization called People Loving Nashville. Um, it actually was started with just a handful of roadies. We um, we we would get home uh, from the bus on Monday morning. We'd get some coffee, take a shower, and then we'd get we'd meet back up at my house and we'd make food and just bring it down to those that needed food downtown Nashville. You know, we were like, okay, there's hungry people. Let's bring food to them. And it grew. And it, we've been doing that for 12 years, and it's been a really beautiful thing. Um, but to answer your question, you know, how can we um, stay engaged with community, um, not only within our, our, our circles, but even maybe beyond that. Um, there was a, uh, I don't know if you guys have read this, it's an article, it's definitely a few years old. Um, there was, I can't remember exactly who this person was, but he was a, a big time production manager. And it was during, uh, I think, one of the natural disasters, I want to say uh, one of the hurricanes. And he wrote a, an article saying that, that roadies are the best responders to tragedy and to things that need to happen really fast. And he wrote uh, a quick article about how he found out about a need, I think it was in the Philippines, that they needed to get you know, a bunch of supplies over there really quickly, and then they needed to coordinate a bunch of logistics to get those supplies distributed. And he saw that you know, things weren't happening really fast. So he's like, well, I kind of do that for a living. You know, like I jam a bunch of crap into a truck and get it somewhere, and then I get it unloaded and get it distributed to where it needs to go so he gave it a go and he just kind of wrote this this article and it was really inspiring to me to think about you know the amount of uh, uh ability that we have as as roadies or or whatever variation of roadie that we might be where we've been in high st high stress situations we've been in lack of sleep situations we've been um in a you know you only have one shot to to, to nail this thing situations we've been you know, crawling around on a dark stage and repairing a cable with whatever, or been high in steel and, you know, wherever that those things are, there's some really great um, attributes that we've added to our toolkit and realizing that we have that. So it was really fun, you know, when we, early on when we were serving uh, those in need on the streets of Nashville alongside a bunch of roadies because, you know, we're dealing, we're, you know, <laughs> we would come across a, a bunch of folks that were not so happy uh that day or had you know been interesting to talk to we we're like oh man we come across that every day <laughs> like that's a normal thing you know that's and so we just kind of use those little skills that we've learned how to treat people how to talk to people but then how to just realize oh man i actually have a lot to offer because of the lifestyle that i've been attuned to uh for however long we've been doing it i would say that anybody that's been on the road for like one tour i would say yeah you're ready for battle you know you've you've done enough and so to answer your question with that, on one front, I would say that there's many organizations uh, within our communities right now that are se uh, severely lacking in volunteers. Uh, they're severely lacking in, in, in processes. And, and, you know, a lot of times they, they, they've set policies within their organization that they're not allowing people to go out into the field, which is understandable. But right now, things are starting to open up. So, for instance, in our community in Nashville, the Mission Army is asking for volunteers like crazy. And they're, they've been serving meals every single day in some of these encampments um, since the COVID crisis started because they're like, well, just because I, you know, I, I, I need to shelter in place doesn't mean that everybody can shelter in the place. And so they provided policies and protocols to say, hey, we can protect you as a volunteer to go onto the front line. So I would say that there's plenty of opportunities. And if you go into whatever local community that you're in, you can find opportunities uh, to serve those in need. Uh, on many different fronts. So if you're a Nashvillian, you know, Hands on Nashville is a website, H-O-N, I think it is, dot com, or Salvation Army, or even just check us out, peoplelivingnashville.com. We can plug you in to places. Another uh, fun thing that I've seen, you know, one of my fellow engineers, um, Paul Chambliss, he, um, he's been uh, mixing for his church, and he's been doing live stream stuff there, and he's also like, you know, upping his uh, his recording game. He's a modern engineer by trade, you know, audio engineer by trade, but he's hosting videos and he's had a really funny uh, uh, thing where he's trying to replicate all the funny little nuances on the road uh, at home. And so he, uh, 
I can give you an example. He was like, um, find, uh, find something heavy to lift and call three other friends over to lift it up on three and then have, make sure you have one person complain that there's not enough people to lift this thing up. <laughs> so, he was like, man, you know, let's bring the road back home and just have a little chuckle about that. But he's staying <laughs> positive and, he, you know, he's spreading that like kind of communal thing like, hey, we're all in this together. And so I think there's, you know, houses of worship. There's also like, you know, people that are doing live streams that you can offer these services to say, you know, other production companies are doing the same thing. They're like, hey, we have a live stream studio ready to go. It's fired up. We're connected to the Internet. Come on in and do something. So I think people are staying innovative and staying awake. And, and, and not saying like, okay, we'll just wait till the, this machine starts back up. Um, like you were saying earlier, Kelly, I think that having that one extra thing in your arsenal uh, would be a, a good idea. Uh, but I think knocking on doors and keeping communication open, even a phone call to, you know, uh, um, so give me another example. One of our uh, young gals that we hired on our last tour, she's like, what can I do in this time? I was like, you know what you can do? You can go back to that tour book and you find every single person on that tour book and you call them and you say hello and you do that out of a genuine heart. call them and say hey how are you doing check in is everything okay and then at the end if you feel the opportunity to say hey when things fire back up or if you have opportunities right now i'd love to be on your list because there's the thing like me as a as a you know a, a, in my position where i'm hiring folks or finding people for right positions there's times where i completely forget that there's a perfect candidate for this position it's because I'm moving so fast and having so many conversations and emails I'm like oh man I forgot that two months ago I ran into this guy and he said hey I'd really love to be you know an LD or a lighting tech and I completely forgot about that conversation but I did remember about the conversation I had three days ago with somebody that said hey I'd like to be on your list so another piece of advice I would give out to anybody who's wanting to continue their career uh, in the music touring industry, or if they're wanting to start it, um, is, is master the art of checking in and being genuine and not being annoying either. And so, I, you know, I think that there's there's three parts to that, you know, checking in with people of influence, people that are, you know, talking to people, like Jim was saying earlier, you know, like you get hired for a gig, they might ask you, hey, do you have a system tech in mind? You're like, I definitely do, actually. Do you have a monitor engineer that you work with a lot? I actually do, you know. You know, there's people that, you know, you, you can refer, and so you want to be on their mind. So pick out some people, check in with them, and be genuine. Don't be a jerk. And, you know, like, hey, uh, how are you doing anyway? Looking for a job. You got one for me? You know, but I think we can be genuine, and we can be straightforward, um, but we can also be brief, and we can be bright, uh, and, and, and not be um, annoying, either. <laughs> too. So I hope that, that that's helpful um you know on, on, on many different fronts yeah you know um uh somebody just posted in the question uh jaybor that the just a bunch of uh roadies.org for uh for community service and uh i know one of the 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 folks on uh watching us today mark uh sarantakis you know we were talking about this over email it's like hey that he he really helped me remember that being service oriented is important during this time. Um, you know, uh, I, I get a little focused on the webinars. I get focused on, you know, well, what is, what do I need? What does my family need? And, and that's important. Don't get me wrong. I, they would agree. Um, but um, this broader sense of we, this is something we do day in and day out. We solve problems for a living and then we do a show, mm -hmm. right? that's how it works you put enough of those together um you know uh i'm i'm thinking about what are my what are my options around me right now going hey where where can i go do something i'm, I'm not talking about yeah. going and donating but what is that was that something i should go do physically hey i'd be healthier yeah. for it but also saying hey this is one thing we have and i i don't mean to sound preachy but we got we got time. That's one thing we have now that we didn't have. And um, how much time we're going to have, I don't know. I'm hoping that window keeps shortening up and, and you know, I'm feeling positive. But, um, you know, what what are we doing in our in the world around us to, to bring our skills to bear as well as just our 
but I think are pretty good attitudes. You know, Jim, um, I think your your ideas of what makes a good system tech makes a great volunteer as well, right? Sure. Yeah, and for, for all our roles, I mean, uh, you know, just like like you mentioned family, you know, being of service to your family is uh, uh, it's part of what we're doing right now. We're being quarantined and we're being told we can't go and do this job that we get to do that we love so much. But we get we're getting to serve our families right now. I'm getting to spend so much time with my family and and that is such a blessing. I, I you know, my calendar year was not going to give me many days off at home this year. And uh, boy, did that change. Um, yeah. But uh, but yeah, it, it, every every role, every role on tour. I mean, you know, I you know, we mentioned Carter Hasselbrook. He was my system guy last year on on Peter Frampton. And Carter just has has a servant's uh, spirit. You know, he it, it was never corny and it was never fake when he said, you know, uh, I'm here to put the best PA up for you today so you have a great show. It, I never, it was always a cooperative um, uh, relationship we had. And, and my feeling as a front of house guy was, you know, um, let's do this together. Let's, let's, let's have a great show together. Let's, uh, you know, let's work together on the tuning and, and uh, oh, we got this odd show coming up. Uh, let's sit down and talk about it and, and come up with the best way. And, and I, I feel like so many people in our industry are like that anyway. Um, you know, they're long days. They're uh, you give a lot of things up to go on the road. So I feel like that kind of comes with the territory to just be a servant out there. Um, but uh, and and I, I must say, just as far as community and uh, Ryan, that's just amazing what you what you're doing there in, in Nashville. That's Hats off to you, man. That's that's amazing, and all the people who do that with you. And uh, um, one thing I I, I will say, you know, speaking of webinars and things like what we're doing right now, is um, I think it's been really cool how our whole industry just said, man, we have all this knowledge, and there's so many people who want to learn more about what we do, but we never really have tons of time to to give that to people. And um, I mean, there's a few things out there that are going on that you have to pay for, but a lot of this knowledge sharing, this this uh, spirit, the last two three months of of just making a video or or jumping on a podcast or a webinar, and just just you know, if I was uh, an up and coming person in the in the industry right now who who uh, doesn't get to go to school right now because schools aren't open or whatever, man, school is open every day uh, on the web. I mean, there there is a lot of really smart people uh, passing on knowledge for free, telling great stories, keeping it light, having fun. And, um, you know, I think that uh, I think that as a as a production community, we've we've all really embraced this time, this quarantine time to to just just collectively share with each other what what we know. Yeah, and and you know, Mark just posted something in the question thing that here's a great example um, of uh, he was offering to organizations that needed to stream how to how to get the audio interfaces hooked up to their laptops, whatever that whether that's a nonprofit, whether that's you know even a for profit company. Um, uh, I, I think a lot of things when people need help now is that time. And we don't think about, you know, what we have a lot of times is knowledge and experiences, as you said, Jim, and reaching out to just um, uh, doing uh, to, to say, Hey, you know what? I, I, I got this skill. Can I help you out somehow? Right. And through that, we make all kinds of new relationships I sent a note out to um, somebody as a, we've been fighting this IEM problem. He's in, uh, you know, in between shows when I'm home off the road, I would go over and try it. And I, I just sent out a note and said, hey, I'm home for a while. I've tried to pick two or three organizations where I can say, hey, I'm available, except when I'm webinaring. Um, I'll, I'll come out. I'm not, I'm not 
promise into, and I'm not trying to take a work away from vendors, right? That's one of the things that's really important to me. Mm -hmm. if, if, you, if, you're, if you're taking away work from somebody who could get paid, you know what? There's a lot of great opportunities like Salvation Army, where you can go out and put your other part of your brain to work there. And we don't take work away from somebody. But if you're if you see an organization that doesn't have the means to hire a company, go to that vendor and say, hey, I'm working on this project over here. Would you help me out? We know they don't have the money. Um, do exactly what all of us have been doing, which is building back our relationships, right? That that are normally, hey, you know, I, I joked with Jim that I've talked to Jim more in the last three months than I have in the last 15 years since I've known him, right? Um, and that's because we have we have time. And so I guess that's one of the things I'm just I'm throwing out there to to folks. Let's let's think bigger. Um, let's let's not cause anybody to lose income. We don't need to to just go out and do something that somebody else is is able to do or is was you know prepared to be paid to do. But there there are so many examples. You know, for every one of those, there's about 600 examples of nobody has the means and help them right. right get in there you got a whole toolbox of audio interfaces laying around right that aren't doing anything put them to use right so um again i don't mean to to be getting out there trying to bang on everybody but you know what um i i think everybody would agree we're in a unique time right now not just covid and building community and building bridges is the single most important thing we can do right now, anywhere you're at, and we got an opportunity to do it, so let's take it, right? No excuse. Um, uh, again, speaking to myself here, um, I'm going to go back and play this recording later so I can remind <laughs> myself of everything I committed myself to doing. Yeah, that's right. So, I got you down for like six things already. You got me down. I put me down for at least two USB interfaces and one Firewire. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, but anyhow, um, you know, Ed, uh, I, I don't know any, any closing thoughts guys that you, I, you know, want to, want to throw out there to folks, um, uh, and, uh, uh, thoughts around gear thoughts around the industry. It's open to anything. Uh, I wouldn't mind just saying quickly <clears throat> that um, for folks who who have been watching all these webinars and and all all the uh, amazing stuff that's just available, um, I, I know a lot of people have waited, you know, gone to some of the schools, Full Sail, uh, Belmont, all these just these amazing schools that are around the country and, and they, they are, pro, they, you know, three months ago, they were about to go on their first tour and, and get that opportunity that they've been waiting for. And then, you know, then, then all this happened and we're all quarantined and staying at home. And then they, they have that feeling like, like you were saying, Ryan, where when it, when it goes back, there's going to be a hundred people hankering for those 10 jobs and these, these, people who have invested all this money and this energy into being ready to to go on their first tour and they're so excited for it are thinking, man, I'm I'm never gonna get picked. I don't have the experience. But um but like we've kind of been saying over and over again, you know, just just take it all in. Uh spend as much time as you can just staying up on your craft, uh whether, you know, getting certified for for things there's dante there's smart certifications there's all kinds of stuff that you can be doing and um and and like you said yeah take take a few moments uh every day just to reach out to someone who was cool to you you know someone who you talked to at a gig who was really nice and you said hey I, i'm gonna get in the industry i'm i'm gonna go to full sale i'm gonna do this and you know if, if you have that person's inf information check back and say yeah i just completed my course i'm ready to go uh i just want to be on your mind um and like you said a lot of people are getting a lot of phone calls every day i i, I find myself spending a lot of time every day just uh catching up with people and um i i really appreciate it when someone reaches out to me and just said, asks if i'm okay 
and checks in and uh you know let lets me get back to some of the other things I'm up to that day so um just just hang in there if you've uh you know if you just started in this business or you're about to start in this business just hang in there it'll it'll get going again and you'll get your chance but but just uh keep you know keep that great energy going and and stay in touch with people and and we'll, you'll we'll be back to it I think that's awesome, Jim. I, I probably, I just want to piggyback on that as well. Uh, I, I remember uh, when my first tour that fell through, um, you know, it was supposed to be 40 dates and it turned into four. And then I went, Oh crap, how much do I pay in rent again? And I was a young man and I thought, Oh, I, I had this happen to me before. And it was a, it was a trying time, but it was one of the best times of my career um, because it was, a, it was an opportunity to reset and to set actual goals because i think a lot of what the the cadence of our normal touring life is you know we get on a tour and halfway through that tour we we've dialed it in we've got everything going on and then we're actually looking to the next season to say like okay what am i doing on you know in the summer and then what am i doing in the fall and then do i get a winter tour and so we rarely have the opportunity to be able to pause set goals and even celebrate milestones that we've already accomplished and so I think that those are important things where we set, you know, short term goals and then long term goals, you know, short term goal might be something like, yeah, you know what, I'm going to I'm going to get, you know, smart certified or like what Jim was saying, Dante certified. I think it'd be awesome. You know, and, and there's schools everywhere. YouTube is incredible right now. If you want to pay a few hundred dollars, you can get education and, you know, you could probably dink around with whatever you got in the house and, and, and really dial in your skills. Um, so the short-term goals being that, and then long-term goals being like, man, I, I really want to do a stadium tour, and whatever whatever uh, you know position that might be, I want to be on a stadium tour. I want to be on a U2. I want to be on a Taylor Swift. I want to experience that and see what that's like. Um, or if you're like, man, I want to go back to my my old days of just club rock and roll. You know, like set big career goals and at least just be aware of those things. Um, but in light of all that stuff, you know, remember. Like wow, you know, I completed school. Like I, that was a big deal. Like I, 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 I went through four years of school, or I went through a program at Full Sail, or whatever program that you ended up going to, um, and being and, and setting aside a time to uh, to celebrate that. Um, but I, I think it's just as uh, important too to stay as as up as we can on how trends are changing uh, and shift, um, because I do think that. I mean, I'm no, I have no crystal ball, but I'd imagine 2021, there's going to be a good amount of opportunities, you know, and things will be starting to open up as far as um, events are concerned. Um, but being open to whatever opportunities those might be, because events can look very different, you know, from here on out. It might not just be concerts. It could be the conference realm, or it could be, um, you know, even, <laughs> I mean, I got a lot of friends that are in the wedding industry. There's a lot of money in the wedding industry. So just be thinking about that stuff. Like, I know it's not as sexy to be mixing a, a wedding band, but I mean, I don't know. It's a thought too, to mix a wedding band and then go home and sleep in your own bed at night. You know, just be <laughs> thinking about those sorts of things. More it's industry uh, out there. There's the streaming industry we were talking about, houses of worship. You know, there's a lot of different opportunities out there. And just because you need to do one for one season doesn't mean you're going to do that forever. And I don't think that any of our opportunities will ever will learn something from even the crappiest of all crap gigs. You will learn something off of that and you'll be able to take that to the next level. Um, so realize that if you're, yeah, like Jim was saying, if you're starting out, man, like I say personally, this is just Ryan saying, take what you can get and learn from it and build on that because it doesn't have to be forever. And I think that um, none of those opportunities, if you're keeping your eyes open, uh, will will be a waste of time. The um, I I I think that sums it up really well. And I'd love to just highlight one thing that keeps showing up in every part of our conversation, and that is the cross discipline that we keep hearing about. Whether it's streaming, whether it's the radio broadcast, whether it's the wedding industry. And guess what all this has in common? It has in common that it, the more we understand about other disciplines and the interdiscipline relations, um, Dennis made a great point about 
being able to bring up the quality of what we're doing. Well, if you understand what the television workflow is, you can bring that to your mm-hmm. stream. If you understand how radio stations really, and this is all on the internet, I've, you know, uh, I've, I've learned it over the years, um, we, we can apply what has been used and and the wedding industry right um this is all stuff we've been doing forever working for the integrators so many opportunities if we look at cross discipline what can i take away from that and apply to what i'm doing and then finally i would challenge everybody every whether it's every couple weeks whether it's once a week try and find something that you can go volunteer in where it can help you bring these skill sets that you have for problem solving and apply them to real life situations and to um uh it doesn't always just take money because that's not something we got a lot of right now um necessarily but i got time and i got skill and i have knowledge how can i help you so i'll leave us with that and thank you ryan for being a part of this thank you jim for being a part of this i know we uh i hope everybody uh you know has a great remainder of the week please stay positive find community build 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 bridges anywhere and everywhere that you can build a bridge all right so uh to that end have a great night and uh pete i'll be seeing you on friday definitely talk dante again definitely yep yep yep. technologies so um meanwhile and between now and then maybe we'll get a tour you never know you never know you never know. You got to keep know. your options open. There you go. <laughs> my op- my and, options and are wide I'm, open. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I want to make sure everybody, when they go out on tour, stays in shape. So oh, when yes. you get out on tour, make sure you do your push-ups every single venue. Uh, this is a, 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 with my Bon Jovi tour, and I did push-ups after every single coordination in every venue in every country. And... Uh, it gave me something to look forward to. And uh, I never did many push-ups, 25 or 30, but the whole point was just to do them every day. So. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't even talk about that. That's a topic that we were thinking about, the health. How do we maintain, because the key to maintaining good mental health is also maintaining good physical health. Yeah, yeah. I put on the COVID-19 right here um lots of pastas lots of starches um but um we uh we need to do that we we need to stay physically fit in order to stay emotionally and mentally fit that they all they all work together so good good point pete i'm gonna go do three of them now maybe we start doing there you go i'm gonna challenge you to start opening our pst's uh once a week with some push-ups pete all right nice uh uh uh, 25 push-ups exactly every every opening we got that on on this same tour uh there was a point during the show when there was a lull uh, and and about 20 people in the crew would do like 25 push-ups and and two minutes of plank backstage it was a crazy crazy look but hey we were we were all just crazy well, every 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 day I uh, every day I wake up and I don't have a gig. I'm going to do 20 push-ups, so I should be in great shape. By, <laughs> there uh, you go. There you <laughs> go. That old mixing arm is going to be back in no time. <laughs> exactly. You'd be, you'd be yeah. able to lift the mixer without three other people. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, meanwhile, have a have a great night, everybody, and thanks again for being a part of this. So long. Thanks for having. All right. Thanks for having. Me.